Now let's take a look at some authentic Hall County attractions with roots right here in the foothills of the Appalachians. The roots of folk pottery in northeast Georgia run as deep as the clay in these hills. Michael Crocker is working to keep alive a tradition that has been here for centuries. He owns a pottery shop in Lula and will gladly give tours to the public. And Michael is a curator of the Folk Pottery Museum of Northeast Georgia in Sautee. When I was uh, 12 years old, uh, one of my neighbor friend's uh, parents had a pottery shop. It was Wilson Pottery just right down the road, a couple of doors down from where we lived. And I would love playing around there in the old pottery shops and seeing all that clay, you know, and the pottery and all the jars being made and the potters working there and they didn't want us kids in the in the shop so they figured the best way to handle that is just to make us work so I got a job starting at 12 years old there and, and started working in the clay and turning some most of all the traditional stoneware pottery really went out back in the uh, 50s and 60s and it went to horticulture or gardenware mostly a lot of gardenware made these days at the, the production pottery shops. But what we do here is, is continue the traditional aspect of it with the glazes and the decorations and the, like the face jugs and the like of that. The traditional pottery um, or folk pottery is one of the rarest forms of folk art in the country. Um, traditional pottery is, uh, is an apprenticed craft. You can't learn it in a book and you you're not a self. You're not self-taught. You have to learn it out of hand and mouth to ear, so to speak. It's uh, something that's learned, and it's usually a community-based. And in the 1960s, it was almost completely wiped out. There was only a couple of potters left in the country, and and really only one that that held true to the traditional aspect of it with digging the clay out of the ground and grinding the glaze and the glaze rocks and making you know all the pieces by hand on the old treadle wheels and that was Cheever Matters and the Smithsonian fortunately came down and founded their first folk life exhibit that year in 1967 using him for the documentary and from that the potters of today you know are, are thankful and fortunate that that they did that because that put it over into a collector's market rather than just a utilitarian market for putting up kraut or pickled beans or milk or whatever you would use the pottery for. Now we still make those forms but we decorate them and the decorations are what are is largely collected by collectors all over the country. We've had collectors here from Scotland, England, Australia, Germany, Japan and all 50 states and we have groups come here, had all 50 states folklorist here in a group and have ceramic circles, international and local groups. Uh, you know, we don't rarely turn anyone away and we're open to the public and uh, love, love to have groups come in. The roots of Northeast Georgia pottery are deep. They go back uh, to Edgefield County, South Carolina and up into North Carolina up in the Catawba Valley area. Back in the early 1800s, potters from those areas came into White County, Georgia and to Barra County, Georgia. The first potters in Barra County were Ferguson's and there are still Ferguson's that are making pottery today that are a direct descendants of those very potters. They brought the, the, gla the traditions of the forms and the glazes into this state. And that was at a time when the south was really developing more and people were moving out west and coming down from Pennsylvania a lot of the North Georgia potters were from Pennsylvania area and a lot of the history here is from that area uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, history in South Carolina that's still celebrated today because of the craft being so important it tells a story of a way of life that was important to people up until the modern age of the industrial revolution and the electricity and and canning jars glass plastic you know Tupperware you know all that played an important role in wiping out the the need for utilitarian stoneware jars we have set a lot of uh, very important historical pieces of pottery here 
at Crocker Pottery. Uh, one is uh, a face jug made by Cheever Matters, and um, he was the focus of the first folk life exhibit the Smithsonian documented in 1967. And he took over the family operation in 1920. And at that time, rarely would potters make face jugs or any decorated item. Matter of fact, Cheever said they were too time consuming and he didn't want to fool with them. Uh, little did he know that one day they would be worth a thousand times more than just the jug itself. I have the first face jug that Cheever Matters ever made in 1920 and it's a very very important powerful piece of folk art and it has an iron sand glaze and as you're down in the creeks or sometimes on the road banks you'll see this black iron sand and he actually took that and mixed it with wood ashes and and made a glaze out of that. A kiln opening is a festive event we have about uh, four a year here and uh, we make you know about 150 pieces of pottery up and it's all you know about half decorated about half just plain and uh, a couple of glazes a flint glaze and a, uh, what's called a tobacco spit glaze it has a runny uh, texture on the outside and it's an old ash glaze but it's nicknamed tobacco spit because that's what it looks like on the outside but at a kill opening here I will announce it about two or three weeks ahead of time and the the, the word just spreads and we have collectors from the surrounding states and sometimes from a way off will fly in and they'll line up at the door and I've had kill openings in the last year that have sold out in as little as four minutes. I'm a collector myself and and my collection is like a puzzle. There's all the pieces are there. There's nothing missing but when I find another piece it goes between these two. So it's uh, it's, it's addictive. So fair warning for anyone that wants to start collecting because you know you can get hooked fast. This will be a one gallon vase I'll flute the top. It only takes a second to flute the top. Pretty cool little technique you do with a couple fingers. That's called a palm draw. This is a knuckle draw. I've got my knuckle over here drawing that up right there. I flare that top out a little bit. A lot of these were made in the 1920s when a lot of the, when prohibition came around, there's a lot of jug shots went out of business and potters had to resort to making functional yet non-utilitarian pottery. So they made a lot of these little vases and pots. Put flowers in. They'd glaze the inside but not the outside. That way they'd ration the glaze and you could still put live plants in there. This is a Wendy's fork. Put a little design on the side there and give it a little one-two like that. And flute the top here. I dug this clay about six miles from here at a neighbor's pond. It's a real good clay. It's got a lot of aluminum in it. Burns real light in color. Ta-da!